This is chapter two, lesson one, describing location in a distribution. Uh, so we're looking at data and how we can compare data relative to the rest of the distribution from which it came. So our key question is, what methods can we use to compare data relative to its distribution? The first method with which everybody who's taken a standardized test is familiar is a percentile. A percentile tells you on a test what percentage of the people who took the test had a lower score than you. So in the SAT, for example, or the PSAT, if you had a 99th percentile, you did better than just about everybody, 99% uh, of the people who took the test. So percentiles also line up with our quartiles. Because a quartile, Q1, is the 25th percentile, one quarter of the data falls below it. The median would be the 50th percentile. Half of the data falls below it, meaning half also is above it. And the 75th percentile uh, is the third quartile, meaning 75% or three-fourths of the data falls below that point. So graphing percentiles can be uh, one good way to see a distribution and to see how a distribution pans out. And it will give us an idea of uh, the location of data. Um, it looks different than a box plot, but in the same way we can see how spread out data is based on a percentile graph. So one way we can graph percentiles is a cumulative relative frequency graph. So um, we've used a histogram to describe frequency where we had the amount of times a data point appears on the y-axis or the percent of time it appears on the y-axis uh, and then we had the data itself on the x-axis. A cumulative relative frequency graph plots the percentiles of each data point. So that means that on the y-axis we have 0 to 1 or 0% to 100%. On the x-axis we have our data points. So the highest point on the y-axis would be 100%. On the x-axis, we uh, have our, depending on our range of data, we have our lowest value on the far left, um, and we have to go up to our highest value. Let's take a look at what a cumulative relative frequency graph looks like so I can help explain. So here we have one of old faithful eruptions. And we can follow and see here we have the percents. They're not labeled as percents. Here it goes from 0 to 1, 1 being 100%, 0 being 0%. Uh, point 0.2 being 20%. So we can see that if we line up with 2, that means a 2-minute um, eruption from Old Faithful, 20% is where it lines up with. That means 20% of the Old Faithful eruptions are less than 2 minutes. Um, so we can see where a good amount of our data lies. Where the slope is higher, we have more data points. Where the slope is lower, we have less data points because the distance between 2.5 to 3 is very slight. That means we don't have a whole lot of data that's in between two and a half. We don't have a whole lot of eruptions that are in between two and a half and three minutes. However, here, where we get a higher slope between four and four and a half minutes, that means we have a good amount of data that lies here between four and four and a half minutes. So the slope here tells us where a lot of our data lies. If it flattens out, if it became completely flat, that would mean there's no data points in that interval along the horizontal line. Um, and if it became this tall slope, it tells us there's all, uh, quite a bit of data because we go from a little over four minutes being at the approximately 45th percentile there to four and a half minutes being at the 80th percentile. So that means 35% of the data lies here between four and four and a half minutes. So 35% meaning 80 minus 45%. 35% of the data is right in there between four and four and a half minutes, quite a few eruptions. So cumulative, meaning it adds up. Relative frequency, meaning percents, what percent of the data is below it. So each of these points represents a percentile. You find the duration on the x-axis. Five minutes, for example, we'd go straight up, and we could see that about 98% of the data, it falls below that. That means about 98% of eruptions are less than five minutes, and having an, an eruption over five minutes would be quite rare. Another way to describe our data is a z-score. Now, z-scores are going to be very important to the class. Um, cumulative relative frequency is also helpful in percentiles, but z-scores are going to be key, and we're going to be looking at these a lot uh, as we go forward in the next couple chapters. So the z-score, what it does is it tells you how many standard deviations something is away from the mean. And it does that by, first you subtract the data point, is represented by x. You subtract the mean of your data from that. So that tells us the distance from the mean. And then we see the standard deviations. So we divide by the standard deviations. So that will tell us how many standard deviations. Is it one standard deviation away from the mean, two standard deviations away from the mean, three? 
and we'll find that most of our data falls within three standard deviations of the mean. In the next lesson, we'll talk about a rule where we know 68% of the data falls within one, 95% of the data falls within two standard deviations. So the z-scores can be a very powerful way of knowing how likely it is that data um, appeared in a data set and what couldn't be due to chance variation. For example, if we have an outcome of something that we're questioning whether it was fixed or rigged, if we look at the whole data set, and it's an extreme outlier, we can say that there's a very minimal chance that, it, that, that, that that data is legitimate and happened by chance. So this is going to let us say how likely it is that data is included in the data set by telling us the distance, the number of standard deviations something is away from the mean. So um, to get this, we, uh, so let's do an example here. If a student gets a 93% on a test uh, and an average is 80, the standard deviation of 6.07. We subtract the point, 93, their score. We subtract um, the mean from that for 13 and divide by the standard deviation. And that means that this student <clears throat> score is 2.14 standard deviations above the mean. So a very strong score, uh, far above the mean. Um, not too many scores were likely above that, but some likely were. Some were higher than that. So two standard deviations from the mean, that's a pretty high z-score. So we're going to see how z-scores relate to the area under the curve and how we can read a graph and know what percent of data falls to the left of when z is 2.14. Right now, the main thing to keep in mind is the z-score and percentile are both ways to transform our data um, and tell us relative position uh, relative to the distribution from which it came. So a percentile tells us what percent of the data is higher and lower. It actually, the number tells us what's lower, but since we know 100% is all the data, we could also infer how much data, what percentage of the data is greater than that value. Z-scores tell us uh, the location in terms of the mean and standard deviation, with a negative number for Z-score indicating that a number is less than the mean, and a positive indicating that it's greater than the mean. And then the magnitude, the number, indicates how many standard deviations, a positive one being the number of standard deviations greater than the mean, and a negative z-score being less than the mean. So z-scores and percentiles are both very powerful ways of describing data's relative position, uh, position relative to the rest of the data. So here's a graph of z-scores. Um, z-scores will always be centered around the mean, since x, since x, the mean, if we subtracted the mean from the mean, we'd have zero. So it'll always be centered around the mean. Um, and then they'll pan out like that um, to the left and right. This is a nice symmetrical curve for the z-scores. Um, and this is what I was talking about. The rule will be going over that 68% of our data falls within one standard deviation of the mean, meaning one standard deviation to the right, one standard deviation to the left. 95% uh, within two standard deviations to the left and right um, indicated by the main middle area and then this lighter yellow color. And then 99.7% of our data falls within three standard deviations of the mean, indicated by this, the rest of the new area indicated by this yellow. So this is what we're gonna be talking about and it's one way to transform data to give us um, a powerful interpretation of its relative location. So let's look at what going through these transformations does to the data. So adding a constant, uh, for subtraction, consider our constant to be negative. So adding or subtracting adds A, so whatever the number you added to the data, to the measures of center and location. That means center, mean, median, and location, quartiles and percentiles. So we'd add A to that. So that would just mean Q1, you'd for the data point, you'd add A. For mean, you'd add A. Median, you'd add A. Consider A to be a negative number if we have... Um, for subtraction. It doesn't change the shape of the distribution or measures of spread. Um, because you're adding a number, think about the whole curve just shifting to the right by with each point increasing by A. Uh, and um, IQR just sliding to the right. If we had a negative number or we're subtracting, it would be sliding to the left. So the spread, it's not getting more spread out because every data point moves the same amount to the left or right. Um, the mean moves the same to the right or left. Uh, the whole box plot moves to the right or the left, depending on the magnitude of A. Multiplying um, or dividing by a constant 
multiplies or divides the measures of center and location. So if you multiply by a number, uh, if you multiply your data set by two, then your mean is doubled, your median is doubled, your quartiles are each doubled in percentiles, where, where the location of each percentile, the 40th percentile, the 50th percentile, is doubled. Um, and it multiplies or divides by measures of spread by the absolute value of B. So you, the graph gets more spread out depending on what it is. <clears throat> and it's the absolute value because if we multiply it or divide it by a negative number, then we still, if you divide, multiply it by a negative number, you're kind of switching. It'd be like flopping the data um, 180 degrees or like looking at it in the mirror. Uh, so your curve did a 180 and then it would just get wider by the magnitude of B. So when we multiply or divide, if we multiply by a number, all the data increases, so the difference between two data points. If we multiply by two, it would double. So we're multiplying, so it spreads out more. If we're dividing, it would become come in tighter because the difference between each data point would be smaller. Um, and it doesn't change the shape of the distribution. Uh, it'll get more spread out or less spread out, but the overall shape, any skew, any symmetry, uh, whether it's uniform, wouldn't be different. Any peaks would still be there, so it doesn't change the shape. Uh, applying transformations to z-scores. Let's go into that. So when we're calculating a z-score, we're actually doing two transformations because we're subtracting the value from the mean, the mean from the value, and then we're dividing by the standard d. So we're subtracting the mean from the value and then dividing. So it's two transformations. So we have to keep in mind all of the things that were just said about what transformations do. The shape of the, of the distribution of z-scores would be the same as the shape of the original distribution. The center of the z-scores is always zero. Since the mean is zero, uh, standard, devia standard deviation is away from itself. So to calculate the z-score, we, we do the value minus the mean. So a value that's located on the mean would be zero. So if the mean is five, and we're looking at the data point five, five minus five is zero. And zero divided by any number is still zero. So our center of our z-scores is always our mean. Um, and our spread, since we divide by the standard deviation, of a z-score, the standard deviation of the distribution of z-scores is always going to be 1. So because the z-score is calculated by dividing by standard deviation, when we take the standard deviation of the z-scores, it's going to be 1 at all times because of that transformation on the data. So again, the z-scores, we're subtracting the mean and then dividing by the standard deviation. So we have to keep in mind both of those transformations. The shape stays the same as the original distribution of test scores. Uh, the center is always where z equals zero, which corresponds to the mean of our original data set. So because we're taking the, for the mean, it's centered around the mean in our, in our distribution that's symmetry, symmetrical. When we look at the center of the set of z-scores, because the mean minus the mean is zero, and zero over any number is still zero, the center is going to be at z equals zero which represents the mean of our original data set. And then since we're dividing by the uh, standard deviation, our spread is one. So some ways that we've already looked at it, expl exploring quantitative data are dot plots, stem plots, and histograms. We always want to look for the overall pattern, which involves your socks, shape, center, spread, outliers, or socks would be shape, outliers, center, spread. Uh, five number summary or a box plot and a box plot based on the five number summary. Sometimes with a large number of observations, if we get a regular pattern, we can describe it what we call a density curve. Uh, density curve is going to be really helpful as we move forward. Let's take a look at what one looks like. So here is a density curve. Let's zoom in on it so we can see it a little bit better. Um, and the idea here is that we draw a smooth curve over the data. The total area under a density curve is 1. Our density curve is always on or above the horizontal x-axis. It never goes into negative values of y. So it's always on this horizontal and it's up or above it. It has an exact, exactly an area of 1 underneath this entire curve. So that area of 1 allows us to do some things. Calculate um, how likely it is a value is in our range. So we always have an area of 1 underneath it. It describes the overall pattern of distribution and anything that falls above or below it. The median would be the point that divides it into two shapes of equal area. The mean is the balance point. And for a symmetric curve, these would be the same place. Um, and remember, the mean is always pulled towards the tail. 
Here is your multiple choice question. I want you to describe the shape and center of the distribution of z-scores in comparison with the original distribution of data. I will also post this one on the web page since there's a lot to